everybody, and welcome to the Jackson Hole Eco Tour Adventures Wildlife Wednesday Monthly Roundup. I'm Tenley Thompson. And I'm Tyler Greenley. And we've got some great videos to show you this month. I want to go ahead and dig right into the latest and greatest. Let's go ahead and get started with a bear update. Oh yeah. I actually did the bear update for you this week, and so I hope you guys enjoy it. Here we go. One of the most sought after animals in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem is the grizzly bear. These charismatic carnivores are not only the top predator of the ecosystem, but are some of the most interesting animals to observe in the wild. While on tour, we encountered many grizzlies this summer, and I want to recap on some of the familiar faces we have seen out in Grand Teton in Yellowstone. During October, bears begin to ramp up their activity. They have entered a phase called hyperphagia, a time when they need to consume over 10,000 calories a day to prepare for the upcoming winter hibernation. Most bears have also returned to the lowlands after spending the entire summer in the high alpine country. However, one bear that doesn't travel to the mountains is Grizzly Bear 399, and we enjoy seeing her throughout the summer. Grizzly Bear 399 is a 25-year-old sow who has generations of descendants. We often see her cubs and grand cubs out in Yellowstone and Grand Teton. One of her offsprings we see regularly is Grizzly Bear 610. She tends to be much more elusive than her mother and probably follows the annual bear migration up into the mountains. This spring, we did see her evict her two-year-old uh, male cubs her two two-year-old male cubs, who set out on their own for the first time. Leaving their mother, these young bears face many challenges, both natural and unnatural. One of the offspring of Grizzly Bear 610 and a grand cub of Grizzly Bear 399 is Grizzly 926, a young adult female who appeared this spring with two koi or cub of the year. These cubs are the grandchildren of Grizzly Bear 399 and demonstrate how deeply this bear lineage runs. Grizzly Bear 926 has been seen throughout the summer, and a couple of our guides actually got to see her on a bison carcass uh, earlier this month. This bear lineage, you know, the 399 lineage runs very deep. And to kind of demonstrate this, I made you guys a small family tree showing the different bears in the lineage that we observed this summer. The final member of this family tree is Grizzly Bear 963. She is a four-year-old female that emerged with her first cub ever this spring. That cub unfortunately did not survive, but she was able to mate again later in the season. Raising cubs is a great challenge for bears, and most of them fail in their first attempts. The lessons she learned trying to raise this first cub will be used later in life to successfully rear future offspring. Like I said before, raising cubs is very difficult and only about 50% of cubs make it to their first birthday. One of the many challenges they face includes human interference. That is why we want to remind everyone to be responsible bear viewers out in the field, not to approach, feed, or habituate grizzlies, both for bear and human safety. While raising cubs to adulthood is often difficult, one bear we see regularly that seems to be pretty pretty successful at it is the Lake Butte sow. This bear has not been tagged like many of the bears in the Tetons, and so she has never received an official ID number. Many people call her Raspberry, but we prefer to use official names given to them by scientists and park personnel. That is why we call her the Lake Butte sow. During the summer, she put on quite a show, killing several elk calves this spring and feeding on them with her one-year-old cub. She is often seen during the beginning and end of the summer months, and recently we saw her actually feeding with her cub in a snowstorm. The final bear we saw regularly this summer is the adult cub of the Lake Butte sow. She's not received an official name yet, and so I commonly call her the Pelican Valley sow while on tour. Last week on one of my last Yellowstone tours of the season, I watched this young grizzly feed on a road-killed elk. I'm excited to see what this bear's future holds and where she will end up in the future. Well, thanks everyone. It's been a truly amazing summer and we have had some pretty unforgettable grizzly sightings as well as sightings of a bunch of other amazing animals. My name is Tyler Greenlee and thanks everyone for tuning in. 
Wasn't that cool, everyone? It's always great to see those large carnivores on tour. Here at Eco Tours, we try really hard to show you those large predators, those wolves, those grizzlies. But we see a lot of other wild animals out on tour, including some of the prey items. And actually, Laura is here to talk about some of those herbivores that we have out in the ecosystem. And so here is Laura, and she's going to talk a little bit about pronghorn. Oh, hey, guys. This is Laura. Get ready for some high-speed action out here in Wyoming. It's the annual pronghorn rut. Pronghorn are our fastest land mammal in North America. They can do highway speeds between 55 to 60 miles an hour at a sprint. They were well adapted to get away from a, an animal called the American cheetah that went extinct at the, last, the end of the last major ice age, approximately say 14 or 15,000 years ago. But pronghorn still have that type of speed, which they use during their rut to chase each other around. <laughs> The pronghorn rut isn't quite the knockdown, drag out brutality of the bison rut, but instead more like uh, a really intense game of catch me if you can or capture the flag, where bucks or males chase does around out in the sagebrush or in wide open meadows, trying to show off with their speed and their, their great posturing um, for females to select them to breed. Uh, a buck might accumulate a group of does during the rut which is called a harem. That's really similar to the elk during their rut, where bull elk accumulate their harem of cows, which he's interested in, in mating with and will defend jealously through the fall. And even though pronghorn are not deer, we still refer to a male as a buck and a female as a doe. Uh, actually, the closest relative to pronghorn worldwide is the African giraffe or okapi. Uh, we think that there were 11 similar species to pronghorn, um, but many of them have gone extinct, including three relative species that were in North America when early humans arrived, transitioning out of that last major ice age. It's relatively easy to tell male and female pronghorn apart. Uh, bucks typically have much larger sized horns at about six to eight inches. They're a dark brown or black color, which hook or curve in towards the tops versus a female who has much smaller horns. Uh, her horns are still made out of keratin, but they're usually like half an inch to an inch long. And you know, you may or may not be able to see her horns from a distance. Bucks use those horns to show off. Of course, females are interested in bucks with large size horns, but he, he might also use those horns to fight uh, against another buck or maybe you know, rip up some vegetation or um, throw up some dirt. Uh, I love it when a pronghorn, you know, gets into it with a big sagebrush bush and ends up wearing it kind of like a hat. <laughs> I think that's really handsome. Um, so this pronghorn mating season or rut happens in the fall. About seven to eight months later, the pronghorn fawns are born in our spring, which is you know, early to mid-June. Um, their coat isn't quite as thick or as dense as some of our other ungulates. So they might be born a couple of weeks later when warmer conditions arrive to the valley. Um, at about five days after being born, a pronghorn fawn can actually run away from a human. They're faster than us really quickly. <laughs> they grow up so fast. I have been lucky enough to actually witness pronghorn mating. Now, leading up to the, the pairing, uh, the, the buck actually um, you know, approached the doe subtly. He didn't chase. Um, the chase was over. I guess she was already dedicated to that one buck. <laughs> uh, he showed off his preorbital orbital gland by swapping his jawline right to left to, to display. He made some soft vocalizations before actually mounting that doe to breed, which I thought was a great moment. Love was in the air. <laughs> It's very cool. Thanks very much, Laura. So one of the things I find that we sometimes get excited about what we call charismatic megafauna, the big exciting things like pronghorn and bears, but there's so much more to the greater Yellowstone ecosystem. And one of our most adored local little critters is up next with Charlotte, who's gonna talk a little bit more about the pika. Yeah. 
Hey everyone, Eco Tour Guide Charlotte here, and I'm about to tell you about the epic and awesome American pika. Pika are spectacular little mammals that belong to the lagomorphs, or relatives of the rabbit. Found at high altitudes in rocky or talus areas, they collect vegetation to make hay piles for consumption during the winter months. With consideration for the longevity of their hay piles, pikas even leave the vegetation they collect out in the sun to dry, so it won't grow mold before transitioning the plants into storage underground, where they can access their food from below the snow in their rocky homes. Pika are also an indicator species in regards to the current warming climate. What that means is that the health and stability of pika populations are a bellwether for the overall health and stability of their high alpine habitat and ecosystem. As it is, the small mammal is known to overheat and die when exposed to temperatures as seemingly mild as 78 degrees Fahrenheit. So as temperatures in high altitude areas continue to warm, pika populations are likely to move higher and higher in elevation with lower populations diminishing or disappearing altogether. Thanks for spending a quick moment learning about the epic and awesome pika with me. Thank you, Charlotte, for talking a little bit about pikas and about pika conservation. Um, you know, climate change has had a pretty negative impact on pika. And so uh, big thanks to Charlotte for telling us a little bit about that. All right, next up is one of my favorite animals. It's actually a mustelid and one animal that I really, really enjoy seeing on tour. I actually go and seek them out pretty often. Uh, we're gonna talk, or we're gonna have Sarah Ernst talk a little bit about river otters. River otters are one of our more entertaining animals to watch. They're playful natures. Uh, but they are mysterious. Uh, many of the impressions we get of otters in kind of pop culture is from the sea otter living off the Pacific coast. And those are the otters when you picture an otter on its back uh, slapping um, rocks to break clams on its, on its belly or holding hands in the kelp. Um, those are sea otters. The otter we have here is the river otter, and they tend to be a more shy and elusive species. And even to this day in 2021, they are a hard animal for scientists to study. But new technology like camera traps and DNA testing is starting to reveal a little bit more about the hidden life of the otter. So we all love otters. What do otters love? Well, number one is fish. Uh, another thing the otters really love is each other. And um, being mustelids, or member of the weasel family, we always kind of assumed that otters were solitary because many of the other members of the weasel family are also solitary. But the more we're learning about otters, the more we realize what a complex and dynamic social structure these animals have. Uh, otters look for a mate just after giving birth, only about one to three months after giving birth, and they look for a mate at the end of the spring. And like our um, grizzlies also living in this area, otters have delayed implantation. So they will breed in the spring, but um, wait another eight months or so before starting to um, develop those embryos and they'll be giving birth uh, at the end of the winter, beginning of spring. When we see otters, sometimes we see solitary otters, but in my experience, I often see groups of otters about those groups we're learning can be a female with kits. In some cases, the male will rejoin the female after she brings her kits out of the den and begins to show them around the habitat. In some cases, we're learning males may be playing a role in helping raise uh, their young. Now, males have a larger ter territory than females and they overlap over several female territories. So one male may actually be the father of several different litters of young otters. Um, there also might be groups of otters that are bachelor groups of males, uh, just groups of males having fun together. There could also be otters, um, family groups where you have unrelated otters coming in to help raise the young or related otters. So just like human families, we're starting to learn uh, that with river otters, um, there can be a variety of different family types of different social structures out there. Sarah Ernst signing off. Awesome otters. Thanks to everybody who contributed to 
actually all of our videos this week. We have so many mm -hmm. guides on staff that help us out with all of that. We do always wanna make sure that we're being very upfront with you about our footage. Everything we show you on this program was taken out in the wild, unless we say otherwise. There exactly. were just a couple seconds at the beginning of that clip that were taken at the Grizzly and Wolf Discovery Center, which is a nonprofit located up mm -hmm. in West Yellowstone, Montana, if you ever get a chance to visit. So definitely full disclosure there. In the meantime, you know what October means for us. October is the is the elk rut. It's when the elk breeding season is fully underway and that bugling rings through the morning and evening air. So let's check back in with Tyler yep. and see a little bit more about what we most look forward to in fall uh, every year, which is that awesome, awesome sound ringing through the woods. The elk rut is one of the most exciting times during the autumn season. While on tour, the autumn air is filled with the sound of bugling bulls and the clash of antlers as males wrestle with one another over dominance for the females. However, this isn't a one-sided story and females often decide who they want for a mate. This sparring and mate choice has led to some pretty strong sexual selection. Sexual selection is when certain traits evolve in a species to make them more competitive when it comes to reproduction. An elk, this manifests itself in large antlers, body size, bugling, and some beautiful symmetrical antlers. A bull elk with antlers that aren't symmetrical are less attractive to females and are less likely to be chosen for a mate. Uneven antlers could signal injury or some genetic deformity. We have learned that it is in the female's best interest to choose the most fit and attractive male to father her offspring. This ensures that her offspring will be the most fit when born next spring. There is another theory over why females want males with symmetrical antlers. It's called the sexy sons hypothesis. If a female mates with an attractive male, her offspring will also be attractive. This ensures that her offspring will live on to reproduce with females who find them attractive. The rut also signals another important time for elk. That is the fall migration. And already we see large herds of migrating ungulates moving into the valleys and gathering together in larger and larger herds. The elk rut truly signals the end of the summer season and soon the floors and valleys will be covered in deep snow. We here at Eco Tour Adventures welcome the change in the season and look forward to conducting wildlife tours throughout the winter months. I personally am looking forward to seeing the great migration and showing guests the great herds of elk that gather on the National Elk Refuge after the fall rut. Awesome, awesome footage. Thank you, Tyler, for putting that video together for us. If you ever get a chance to visit us out in the fall, it's a wonderful time of year. Wildlife are at some of their best viewing opportunities for the year. Fall mm -hmm. color abounds. More on it's that so in a little beautiful. bit. Yeah, we've got so much going on out here. Bears and her hyperphagia. Exactly. And boy, to see that elk rut really is something. And we have really just about the best place in the world to see it here in Jackson Hole. So it's time for my second favorite part of every month's broadcast, which is our trivia question of the month. So the way this is going to work is if you want to win our trivia question, all you have to do is comment in the comment section the answer. And mm -hmm. then if you want an extra entry, go ahead and feel free to answer the bonus question and one of you will be chosen to uh, with the correct answer will be chosen to win one of our gift cards to our eco tour adventure store maddie who's moderating our comment section this evening will go ahead and put a comment up for that for that uh, or a link up to our uh eco tour adventure store in the meantime my favorite part of the program my favorite segment which is the ask a naturalist segment comes up after this so if you've got a question about any of the videos you saw or anything that's naturalist related go ahead and start writing those in the comment section and we will answer them live exactly. after we're done with trivia so mm -hmm. if you've got some good ideas there um, all ages if the young folks in your house have questions about the wild world or the old folks in your house have yeah. questions about the wild world we'll do our best to get you guys some answers okay our trivia question this month is sponsored by one of the items from our Eco Tour Adventure store. This month we've got our French coffee presses. Uh, so if you've never actually um, 
been out on tour with us and you've never had a chance to have our French press coffee, people go on and on about how much they love it. We've decided to sell our French presses in the Ecotour store so you can bring those French presses home uh, and get an opportunity to have one for yourself. So Tyler's got one here if you're curious. Here you guys go. Ready? There you go. Oh, I'm going to open it. make the noise. <laughs> We were joking that it's like the Jurassic Park vial where they're taking the DNA yes. out of the park. That's what it sounds like. With the dry ice steaming out. Although I don't know how coffee on dry ice. That might I, be, I don't know. That would be like cold brew. I don't know. I'd have to figure that out. Oh, sounds interesting Coffee to me. sloshy. Anyway, if you'd like a beautiful French press coffee maker, um, definitely go ahead and answer the trivia question. You might have a chance to win one of these or any of the other great items on our Eco Tour Adventure store. And mm -hmm. if you miss our French press coffee from our tours, here's your chance chance to make your very own at home. All right, Tyler, take it away on the trivia question. All right, guys. So last month I asked you a little bit about bears. And so here are the questions from last month. The first trivia question was, how much land does an individual grizzly bear need in the greater Yellowstone ecosystem? And the answer to that question was C, 1,000 to 1,500 square miles, which is a huge land area. That area would occupy almost all of Jackson Hole. And so a lot of our bears move huge distances to find that food. You know, bears are very seasonal foragers and they depend on uh, very localized seasonal bouts of food in order to build up their fat reserves for the winter. And so oftentimes you see bears in the lowlands, you know, feeding on elk calves, on sedge, those early spring food items really early in the year. And then they begin to move out of the valley up into the mountains to uh, feed more on ants, more vegetation in the forest. And eventually they end up on the alpine tundra and on those talus slopes where they're ripping up 300 pound boulders to get at the moths underneath. I read that a grizzly bear in July can eat 20,000 moths oh, in a wow. day. Which in is a insane. day? In a day. Oh my goodness. So yeah. imagine eating 20,000 moths a day. <laughs> so did you answer correctly? If you answered correctly last month, we have notified the winner of last month's trivia. Mm -hmm. So if you hadn't gotten a notification, you probably didn't win, but here's your chance to win this month. Exactly. Go ahead and just tell us in the comment mm -hmm. section what you think the answer is. Oh, wait. Was oh, there yeah. And then there's the, the bonus, bonus question. Yes. Yeah, yeah. The bonus question was what was the main food in August for Grizzlies? Yes. Yeah. And so the main foods were berries, moths, and pine nuts, yeah. so white bark pine. And if you don't know about white bark pine, it is an endangered species that is declining because of climate change and beetle kill, and uh, or bark beetles. And so that is a major conservation concern for grizzlies. And so uh, kudos to you guys, whoever got those answers correct. Yeah. Those were some difficult ones this month. Yeah, let us know in the comment section if you got it right. Because I, I actually had to think pretty hard about last month. Mm -hmm. I think we definitely had a hard one. Don, mm -hmm. if you're out there, you have to tell us how we did. Don always is good enough to tell us every month exactly. whether or not we made a good trivia question or not. Exactly. So Don, tell us what you think. But in the meantime, all right, here's your chance to win for real this time. Exactly. So this is this month's trivia question, and here it comes. All right. What are the primary deciduous trees, trees with leaves that turn brightly colored in the fall in Grand Teton National Park? A, cottonwoods and aspens, B, maples and oaks, or C, beech and sycamore. And to give you guys a clue, most of our trees out here turn yellow. Awesome. And the bonus question for this month are, what are the primary components in the cells of leaves that contribute to fall colors? Ooh, this one's a little bit a different one. Uh, if anyone has, you know, a background in cellular biology or biology, they might know this one. Sweet, so be sure to leave your answers in the comment section. And um, hopefully you guys win and you can get a chance to get, you know, a cool store item, maybe a French press. Whatever. Yeah, with or a grizzly bear on it. Locally <laughs> made art, gifts, mm -hmm. Christmas season's coming up. Definitely mm -hmm. a great way to support us. And, you know, guys, just a reminder, if you just want to support the guides who made these videos for you this week, um, including Tyler and everybody else, mm -hmm. uh, you can always leave us a tip at the Eco Tour store. We, we started putting that in as an item just because folks do enjoy this program um, every single week and they wanted to support the guides who exactly. are making it. 100% of the proceeds from the Eco Tour Adventure store go back to guides and staff and support them. So if you mm -hmm. want to just make a direct support, you can certainly do that as well. And one thing that's really cool is the guides are actually capturing this footage while they're out on tour. Yeah. Yeah, and so if you, you know, those tips would really help support 
um, those guides as they're out there, you know, capturing yeah. those images for Wildlife Wednesday. Yeah. As mm -hmm. always, totally optional. We'll always bring you this content for free. But mm -hmm. if you like it, feel free to send us a tip. We always appreciate that. And uh, maybe we'll send you a little sticker or something. In exactly. <laughs> All right, guys. Super fun. It is time for my favorite part of yeah, the whole program, <laughs> which is uh, Stump the Naturalist. Is that what? No. I, I, uh... It's close. Stump it's the close. naturalist. See if you can stump <laughs> us. The best part about having Tyler with us these days is he knows all sorts of things I don't necessarily know about the ecosystem. <laughs> um, and so we can see if we can stump well, Tyler. Well, it's complimentary because she knows a whole lot that I don't know. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you've got a question for us about the wild world, mm -hmm. uh, Grand Teton, Yellowstone National Parks, wildlife, I don't know, astronomy, anything along those mm -hmm. lines, go ahead, uh, night sky, day sky, oh, geology, yeah. whatever you want to stump mm -hmm. us with, any naturalist related question, go ahead and ask us in the comment section. Now I'll tell you, we're actually going to answer these live. So if you see us looking down, it's because we're looking at our iPad here. Um, and so we're looking at your questions and answering. We'll go ahead and we'll start from the top. Oh, I see a lot of good answers yeah. on the yeah. trivia question. Oh boy. And we'll kind of answer these questions <laughs> in order. All righty, let's see here. If you guys don't know on tour, I do. I play this game, Stump the Naturalist. And oh, do you really? That's awesome. I do. And if my guests win, I give them a granola bar. <laughs> <laughs> That's the prize if they stump me with a question while on, out on, on tour. On my tour, you just get a granola bar. Oh, right? no. <laughs> But I like the stump, yes. stump Tyler. That's pretty great. All right. All right. So first and foremost, Dallas asks us, do animals still fall in the hot pools? Um, yes, Dallas, they do. Mm -hmm. It's, it's surprisingly rare, uh, all things considered, but certainly does happen. So, uh, for the rest of you guys that are not necessarily, um, up to date on Yellowstone and all of its wildlife, we have all these hot springs and thermal features, fumaroles, mud pots that are scattered all throughout the park, primarily in the central area, but you can get them just about anywhere. Exactly. And of course, this is one of the greatest densities of wildlife in North America as well. And so when you have hot boiling water um, in combination with wildlife, occasionally things do happen. The greatest cause of death from thermal features um, from wildlife is actually toxic gas. Every once mm -hmm. in a while, um, unpredictably, there'll be a brief um, toxic gas event. It's never done anything to any humans, and I think it's because mm -hmm. they're not just congregating into an area for 12 hours, but we'll have a couple bison or something like that mm -hmm. that, can, that, that can pass away, usually from the toxicity, either a respiratory failure situation, um, or sometimes uh, it can be even more complicated. And I think it often occurs in areas where there's a hot spring or a fumarole and there's a lowland area associated with that. There's one fumarole in Yellowstone called Barrel Springs, and I know it did emit some of those toxic fumes that, you know, they're heavier than air. And so what they essentially did is they flew or they floated down uh, the Gibbon River and ended up killing um, some bison. And so that does happen. Um, on tour, I actually point out tracks on the boardwalk because... In areas like West Thumb, lots of animals move down through there to get uh, lake or water from the lake. And um, in the winter, bison will congregate around a lot of the thermal mm -hmm. features. And so it's really cool to point out different tracks and different signs that you're seeing around the hot springs. And there's even one hot spring, I think it's called Blue Star mm -hmm. Pool yep. or Spring, that actually has bison bones in it. Actually, there's two. Oh, there's so two. So Blue Star's okay. got bison bones in it. And then mm -hmm. I was about to bring, point out at... Um, Fountain paint pots, there's actually, um, the paint pots have a bison spinal process sticking out. So oh, cool. the, the hump of a bison actually has a bone mm -hmm. in it. And you can actually, I'd like to point that out to guests yeah. there. So you can definitely see the ones in Blue Star Spring a little bit easier. They're a little closer. But if mm -hmm. you ever go out with us, ask your guide to point out the spinal process at fountain paint pots as well. So you, mm -hmm. you definitely can see some examples. And then there's one other thing about thermal features that can be harmful to uh, wildlife, certainly, which is um, those thermal features put out uh, a, a mineral called geyserite, sometimes called sinter, and it excretes itself into the soil around the spring, and then grass will grow around the spring. And mm -hmm. animals like bison oftentimes, rather than migrating, will choose to live near thermal features because that thermal feature melts the snow all winter. Mm -hmm. So it's actually pretty easy because you can get grass around those areas year round but it comes at a price, which is to say those wildlife are eating that mineral-laced grass, which is very, um, that's 
filled with minerals, which exactly. is really, they're hard and they're very hard on their teeth and it wears their teeth down. And so bison who hang out near thermal features have about half the lifespan of bison who don't. And the cause of death is tooth wear and tooth decay. So it's pretty crazy. Um, definitely hanging out near thermal features full time as a bison is probably not a great idea. But on the other hand, there's been some theories out there that their most prime reproductive ages are when they're, when they're younger. younger. And mm-hmm. so evolutionarily, it probably actually mm-hmm. makes a certain degree of sense. And, you know, when we talk about scientific things that are happening out in the field, we often talk about the cost and the benefits. You know, in this case, it actually might be a benefit for the bison to hang out around those hot springs if they're able to reproduce enough to replace themselves during that time. If they have higher reproductive output during those early years because they are hanging out around hot springs, then maybe it's worth it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Live fast, die young. Exactly. (laughs) Have the most babies when you're young and then... That's that, I guess. Or, you know, migrate really long distances and forage a little bit more difficult to progress Mm -hmm. and live to a ripe old age. It's all about risks. You know, the bison that don't migrate to the hot springs, they have to migrate a lot further and often in much deeper snow. And then they have to spend all winter digging for their food. And so both come with a risk and a cost and both have their benefits. And so when animals decide what to do and what behaviors they choose in the ecosystem, they have to weigh the costs and the benefits of those decisions. Yeah. Now, not to go on and on with this question, because yeah. I think we've talked about it for exactly. way too long. <laughs> uh, but I do want to point out, of course, there is one other animal casualty that occasionally happens and did happen in the last month when it comes to hot springs. Domestic animals sometimes do come to harm. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. We did have a dog jump out of a car. Yep. And these dogs, they don't realize the water's boiling. They just see. They just get excited. They see water, oh, yeah. and they jump in. Um, and sadly, this dog did not make it. This has happened mm-hmm. a few times over the years. It's a great reason um, to maybe not bring your dog to Yellowstone. Not a really great place for dogs to be. Mm-hmm. Um, unfortunately, the effort to take the dog out of the water, who didn't survive, did cause some burns um, with the party that was with the dog as well. They're recovering, um, but whew. It's a lesson to all of us. Yes. Don't worry about the toxic gases. The Park Service is super careful about that. You're certainly not going to be at any risk. I'm Um, there almost every day. Yeah. (laughs) I I don't worry about it. Yeah. Not something (laughs) to concern yourself about. It's not a reason not to go to Yellowstone, but it Mm -hmm. does happen Mm -hmm. rarely on occasion, just like hanging out near volcanoes, I suppose. All right. Enough on that. We've babbled on and on, but let's see here. Oh, Susan, this is really sweet. She says, the year went fast in spite of lockdown. Feels so recent when we've heard about bears and hyperphagia, bison rut, etc. Thank you, Eco Tour Adventures. That's so much fun. Thank you guys so much. Well, Susan, it's a good time to mention mm-hmm. that, of course, as always, we are off for November. Mm-hmm. And we won't be around for November. We'll remind you guys of that again. Um, but the December is the best of 2021 yep. episode. So mm-hmm. if you've enjoyed watching it, all of our episodes over the year, we're going to put together Tyler and I's very favorite exactly. videos and show them to you <laughs> coming in December. So you'll get a chance to review some of those Ooh. great ones. But thank you for spending the year with us, Susan. That makes me so that happy. That makes me That's so wonderful. happy. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Oh, this is a great question. Tyler, you want this one? All right, let's see. After visiting Yellowstone National Park never times or many times, I've never seen bison or wolves in the area between mammoth and hell roaring area open grass areas why do they avoid these areas that is a really good question let's see okay mammoth to the hell roaring area it's pretty open up on the northern range so i'm not sure what times of year maybe you're visiting that area that's kind of like the blacktail plateau area Mm -hmm. um in the winter we do get a lot more wildlife Moving through here, the bison actually migrate through there, but in the summer, the bison tend to congregate in Lamar Valley, which is their primary breeding grounds. That's where they have their summer ruts. And so if you're here in the summer, you're probably not going to see a whole lot of bison in the Blacktail Plateau area between Mammoth and Hell Roaring. And because the bison and the elk kind of move out of that area in the summer, the carnivores, the mountain lions, the wolves, they follow those prey resources out of those areas Uh, So wolves congregate in certain areas where the bison are breeding and where the elk are breeding during the summer months. And so that could be a reason. Um, In the winter, though, they begin to congregate back. And 
I can be a pretty big issue in areas like Mammoth and Gardner, especially when you have big herds of elk and bison moving through town. Uh, the wolves don't really obviously come through town. They fear people, but the bison and the elk do move through town and can cause some pretty big traffic jams and obviously some safety issues if you're walking out on the sidewalks there. Um, but typically that might be a seasonal thing yep. that you're experiencing. If you're here only in the summer, uh, you probably won't see those animals in those areas and regions. The best way to think about predators is they're going to hang out where their prey is most dense. Mm -hmm. So as mm -hmm. prey migrates around, the predators migrate around too. Exactly. One of my favorite wolves in Yellowstone National Park's history, 302M, sometimes called Casanova, <laughs> um, actually ended up helping to found a pack in the Black Toe Plateau area. Um, and so definitely... There have been wolf packs in that area. Definitely that area can have grizzly density, but only when the food resources are viable exactly. there, which is not in the dead of summer, certainly, mm -hmm. but certainly more in the winter. So, well, bears are hibernating, but the wolves mm -hmm. are there in the winter. So, yeah, it's it's a little confusing, but the Lamar Valley, for instance, is going to be a far more nutritious place to hang out um, when you're trying to survive the winter. And so, obviously, you're going to have wolves in great density there Exactly. Um, versus kind of out in the middle of a grassland. Exactly. And during the winter, we do get some more animals moving into there. Like a good example is the Wapiti Lake Pack. Mm -hmm. In the summer, they spend most of their time in the interior of Yellowstone, where they're hunting those summering herds of elk and bison. Those herds of ungulates really mi really migrate. They basically evacuate the entire... In, the interior of Yellowstone basically is evacuated by ungulates. Yeah. There's, no, there's no prey resource for there for the wolves. And so the Wapiti Lake Pack actually has to migrate with the herds quite a far distance. Because of that, the Wapiti Lake Pack has one of the biggest wolf territories in Yellowstone and I think in Wyoming mm -hmm. because they have to follow those migrating ungulates. Yeah. Um, and I they do show up on that northern range area. Yeah. So. And if you think about it, the interior of Yellowstone is getting 1,000 inches of snow a year. So that's yeah. 50 feet of snow. There's no way you're going to be able to dig under that and find food. No. So <laughs> got to migrate or die, right? And so therefore the predators are too. Great question. Thank awesome. you very much for that. Libby's got a great one. How is the drought and its effects on wildlife? I recently saw pictures of Ooh. Jackson Lake. <laughs> Libby, um, I am I'm sad to admit almost going to be 40. I'm not sad. I'm going to be a rockin' 40. But um, I, in my lifetime, have only ever seen the lake nearly this low, maybe once or twice. It is really low. Mm -hmm. um, and in the beginning of the season, we did have a pretty substantial drought and the drought continued yeah. to exist a little bit longer in areas of Idaho. That mm -hmm. water in the Snake River, which is Jackson Lake, right, um, is owned by the state of Idaho mm -hmm. and they need to use it for agriculture. And so Jackson Lake is currently at 9% uh, it's of its cap capacity. Yeah. And the Snake River is reduced by over 90% over average flows, not mm -hmm. historic high flows, Average flow. So everything is looking pretty dry. Uh, but yes. um, the good news is, is that Jackson Lake, of course, is a historically dammed lake. So we're almost back to the original three lakes that were dammed together to create exactly. Jackson Lake. Mm -hmm. There's still plenty of water there for wildlife. Our biggest concerns are actually fish. Um, because the state of Idaho took the water out of the Snake River very quickly. They went from a pretty normal flow um, all the way down to almost nothing in less than a week. Mm -hmm. they, had to, they had to bring the water down that quickly in the, in the river. Pretty intense. The, the concern is that the fish were not mm -hmm. going to find their way out of these areas where the water was mm -hmm. reducing and were going to become stranded. There is a volunteer effort in place to try to discover fish kill uh, before snow kind of obscures this to try to understand how damaging a rapid decrease in water in the Snake River would be mm -hmm. in the future. The idea is that could be used as evidence to go to Idaho in the future and say, okay, we know you need the water, but you need to bring it down over a period of, say, three weeks or even longer. You can't bring it down over... So dramatically. Yeah, five mm -hmm. days. That's too quick for the fish. And mm -hmm. so there is some concern about that. As for, you know, small mammals, muskrats, beaver, definitely the loss of water in their ranges and their habitats is a problem as they're coming into winter but the hope is they'll have just enough time to create not as nice but some additional protections um, beaver for instance may build a large lodge um, but they're building it on the periphery of a river and so as mm -hmm. the river recedes they might not necessarily have the same protections they can always burrow into the river bank for winter a little bit of a quicker home something a young mm -hmm. beaver do quite often there are some options for them so 
not great, uh, not ideal, certainly not something we would prefer, certainly something in the future would be far better served uh, if the water rights were managed for the benefit of wildlife. When I was young, uh, and bald eagles were still on the endangered species list, they were not allowed to draw the river down so yeah. quickly, and they had to go slowly because it was important that um, the bald eagles continue to have fish to feed on and also that cottonwood trees continue to be flooded um, because cottonwood trees were important nesting habitat. And so mm -hmm. they actually were regulated under the Endangered Species Act how much they could move the water. Now, of course, the bald eagles have been delisted um, and osprey as well. They can kind of do what they want. So That's so interesting. Yeah. And I always thought, so this is, I always thought that an eagle could catch fish better if the water was receded. And yeah, there but was not if there's not as many But if there's not fish. as much fish. <laughs> yeah, so it's more of like a long-term thing. Yeah. So yeah, so we're, this is more of a concern for like long-term long fish population. Yeah. If the water remains low for a substantial amount of time, it will drop the fish population quite a bit. Short-term, these lower water levels will benefit a lot of the fish-eating birds. Yeah. At Jackson Lake, when they were lowering the water for that irrigation in Idaho, there were a lot of pools and I actually saw hundreds and hundreds of herons yeah. that were staked around those pools, catching all the fish that were trapped in those ponds. And so short term, you know, that's about a food, easy food to catch. But long term, that fish population is going to drop. And then, you know, the eagles are going to suffer because of that. Um, as, so as far as terrestrial mammals uh, not benefiting from the drought, I think the only one that comes to mind in my head, and not really in Jackson Hole, but in kind of the greater Wyoming area would be the pronghorn. Mm. And so pronghorn in the spring rely on those spring rains so that they can build up their food reserves and build up the amount of water in their body so that they can nurse their fawns. And so years that we see a decrease in the amount of rain in the state, we actually see a decrease in recruitment from those pronghorn herds. And so we see, you know, maybe... 30 or so fawns per females, which if you guys don't know, that indicates a declining population. If there's more than 50 fawns per doe, then that, in, that, that uh, suggests an increasing population. And so in years where uh, there is a decrease in rain, we do see uh, that recruitment rate kind of drop. And that's obviously because those fawns need to nurse and the females might not be able to produce that milk okay. if there's not enough rain or nutrition on the ground. That's not so much of an issue in Jackson Hole because we are a higher elevation plateau. We get a lot more rain. We have a lot of snow melt. Glacial it's melt. Exactly, glacial melt. And uh, those pronghorn have easy access to the Snake River and other water sources. It's more of an issue out on the grasslands of Wyoming, areas like Casper and Cheyenne. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's a mixed situation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's been an interesting debate over the years. Should we even have a Jackson Lake Dam? Should mm -hmm. we just go back to those normal three lakes and have no yeah. dam in a national park? And the reality situation is, is water rights in Wyoming mm -hmm. and Idaho are, are way too complicated for that to even be, to be contemplated. Um, and that water does serve an important agricultural use in Absolutely. Idaho. Mm -hmm. um, but this is a good example of what the ecosystem would look like without yeah. the dam, which is pretty interesting. The other kind of bonus is, you know, uh, Shoshone people summered on the shores of what we now call Jackson Lake, but those ancestral lakes historically. And mm -hmm. there are some really cool archaeological sites that have actually been That's relatively so cool. well preserved because they're stuck underwater <laughs> most of the time. And when the water does drain, you can see them. So mm -hmm. about once every 10, 15 years, there's just a brief opportunity. And this year has been a great year to see so some cool. of that. So that's been kind of neat as well. All right. We're going on and on on each of these questions today, but they're such good questions. And we get really in depth. With these questions. <laughs> we, you know, we get really excited when we um, read your, your questions yeah. and we want to give you guys the best answer possible. All right. Let's hear lots of good. Lots of really good answers. This is really good. Mark asks, has the wildfire smoke issue been a problem or is still in Jackson Hole or Yellowstone? You know, actually, it's been a little bit better recently. Mm -hmm. When I was a little girl, we didn't have smoky August, September, October, um, you know, every once in a while. I mean, I remember the fires of 88 barely, and that was quite smoky. That was about as smoky as mm -hmm. I recall because... You know, I remember little me being thinking it was cool. You could stare directly at the sun because it was bright because red. Because it was so because there was so, yeah, much so much smoke. I think when you're six or whatever and you're yeah. told not to stare at the sun, you automatically do it. You automatically, because, yeah. And yeah, so I remember curious. being like, oh, I'm <laughs> being. This is like my memories of the fire of '88, guys. That's how young I was. Um, I remember being like, oh, I can stare at the sun. There's so much smoke, and nobody exactly. can tell me no. Exactly. I mean, 
I'm sure my eyes <laughs> suffered even though there was all that smoke in the air. Mm-hmm. Still a terrible idea, but I was six um, or seven. I, I have to think back on how old I was. But um, yeah, it, historically, it wasn't such a thing. And now we have these massive wildfires every year in Washington and Oregon mm-hmm. and California. And it's kind of come the new norm to it have is. certainly mm-hmm. some days that are pretty darn smoky as the, mm-hmm. the smoke blows uh, to the east. However, this year we didn't have any major fires in Grand Teton or Yellowstone, which mm-hmm. is a mixed blessing again. We kind of need wildfire to keep the ecosystem healthy, but we kind of have had really clear skies for quite a while now. Exactly. Yeah. For, I think for about a month. Yeah. I, I haven't had any smoke recently in about a month, yeah. so it's been pretty good. We haven't had any fires next door, like in Yellowstone, for example. Most of our smoke is coming from out of state. Uh, California, you know, the big Lake Tahoe yeah. fire and that huge Oregon fire earlier in the year, which burned over 300,000 acres, which, if you don't know, is the size of Grand Teton National Park. Yeah. Um, and so pretty devastating. Uh, so most of the smoke we're getting is from out of state. Yeah. And it's interesting. It, I've noticed that in the mornings, it's not as smoky. And then later in the day, and I don't know what that is. I wonder if maybe there's a breeze at night that yeah, blows it out or it gets something. cold and it settles. I'm not sure. Well, Jackson mm-hmm. Hole really is a hole. Sorry, my mouth's mm-hmm. on all sides. So sometimes that weather will just kind of settle down in there. But we do need uh, wildfire in this ecosystem to maintain mm-hmm. healthy populations of lodgepole pine, for instance. That's one of the only ways they can reproduce. Mm-hmm. So we don't want to have no fire. Um, on the other hand, uh, this would be a good year for some controlled burns maybe now that we're kind of yeah. out of our drought. So interesting. Mm-hmm. I'm not sure if any of them are planned. It's been really wet. I think it'd be pretty hard to have a fire right there now. There was one planned, and I think they it, it did go... Um, in in June. Okay. Okay. And yeah, in June there was one in the uh, Teton uh, Bridger National Forest, and so that did burn in the spring. But I don't think there are any planned for this fall. Um, but yeah, fire is really important for this ecosystem, not just for the trees, but for a lot of our wildlife, our a lot of our birds. Um, it really benefits our bears and elk and essentially any of our grazing animals. And so fire is definitely an important part of this ecosystem. Yeah. All right, let's see what other questions there are. All right, Elaine says, love the tour last week. Highly recommend it. <laughs> Elaine, who was your guide? Thank you so much for going out with us. That's <laughs> wonderful to hear. Um, so glad you're out. Tell us a little bit more about what you saw. I want to get here all the details. Thanks so much for that. Let's see here. Tyler, you want that one? Yeah, so do, do bull elk bugle when they are with their harem? Absolutely. So bull elk bugle basically wherever they are in the ecosystem during the breeding season. They'll bugle when they're alone because they're trying to attract females to them. And they'll bugle with their females to try and impress them and then also to keep other males at bay. It's pretty cool because when you see a harem of elk, you'll often have the dominant bull in the middle of the herd chasing the females around, hurting them, trying to impress them with his bugle. But then he has to keep an eye out for what we call satellite bulls because they're circling in in the flanks of the herd, trying to sneak in and chase a female out of the herd so that they can mate with her. And so it is a pretty, it is a pretty exciting thing to watch. And so yeah, bull elk, they do bugle kind of wherever they are during this time of year. I mean, you can just go hiking in the woods and hear them. Look at me, look at me. You don't even really need to see elk to hear them bugle at this time of year. It's a really cool um, time. That's awesome. Oh, Don, he says our questions are getting more more difficult. Don, that's because I made Tyler the trivia master. And oh when boy. I was figuring oh out the questions, they were too easy. <laughs> so definitely good to hear. We appreciate the feedback. Dallas asks, uh, do bacteria reside in the hot pots, in the hot springs? Yes. Yeah. So mm-hmm. all those beautiful colors that you see um, in hot springs, they're, they're caused by thermophilic bacteria, warm water mm-hmm. loving bacteria. And those bacteria are actually what we call extremotherms. They're um, a class of organisms that live in extreme environments. So um, deep, deep undersea and like undersea sea vents or in near boiling water hot springs. One of my favorite, of course, is Thermus aquaticus, yeah. uh, which lives in Yellowstone and is most famous because it's a, what allows us to sequence DNA. Exactly. today um mm-hmm. so some of this bacteria is just really beautiful and colorful that creates all those pretty colors um like you can see Grand oh, yeah. this is all <laughs> thermophilic bacteria and different colors 
um, are the different kinds of bacteria that grow at different temperatures. So that orange is far cooler than the yellow, for instance, as you get towards the center of Grand Prismatic. So some of this bacteria is just simply beautiful. Some of this uh, bacteria over the years has been studied and led to scientific advancement, like mm -hmm. everything we do with DNA today so cool. would only be possible because of Thermos Aquaticus and Yellowstone, mm -hmm. right? And some of it has created some advancements in medical um, technology, antifungals, all sorts of really interesting things have been found in Yellowstone. So yes, those hot springs do have bacteria and those bacteria mats end up actually having great value for all people. Isn't it a good thing we preserved Yellowstone yeah. National Park so we could do what we do with DNA today? It's Very really cool. cool. Yeah. And those bacterial communities are almost like an entire ecosystem themselves. The bacteria is actually kind of a producer and you'll have little insects and flies actually feeding on the algae and bacteria and then wolf spiders running across the water, pouncing on the flies. So it's a whole little ecosystem yep. itself. And some of those animals only reside um, in Yellowstone mm -hmm. National Park and nowhere else on Earth. Exactly. Uh, because they rely on either the warm temperatures like the sand verbena or mm -hmm. those spiders. Uh, so pretty cool stuff. Uh, but yeah, there was a blog post that we had up on our website. Maddie, I'm going to make your life difficult. See if you can't find it from a couple months ago. <laughs> and it was all about the discovery of Thermos Aquaticus and how it led, of course, to mRNA vaccines. And the reason so cool. that we have protections from COVID today mm -hmm. is because of Yellowstone National Park and those discoveries. So kind of a neat one. We'll see if Maddie can find it and link it for you because that's kind of a fun one to pass it's around really to your cool. friends. I found that just a fascinating, fascinating look at our history and its importance. So mm -hmm. pretty cool stuff. All right, we've, we're almost out of time for questions, but we'll see if we can't get a couple more. Let's see here. James, you've got a nice long one, so I'm going to read it. It's a really good question. Hello, I'm just wondering about Grizzly Bear 399's cubs. It's my understanding that this is the last year of hibernation of the cubs with Mother Bear 399. So when spring comes, do the cubs just go off on their own by instinct, or does Mama run them off, or... So they're just off on their own. How does this work? And is it always two years old when they leave? Do the cubs stick together at all? Sorry, so many questions. By the way, the grizzly bear segment was awesome. Great narration. You guys do a wonderful job. So great job, cool. Tyler. Thank you so much. <laughs> um, so yeah, a, a lot of people have this question. And I can't mm -hmm. answer how she's going to do it next year, but I can tell you how historically she's done it. Um, mm -hmm. So... Historically, May is breeding season for grizzly bears. And most of 399's cubs historically have been run off by whatever male is courting her. Uh, and then that oftentimes can be reinforced by 399 herself. So when they come out of hibernation, um, they'll get down to the valley floor, um, spend a little bit of time with her. But as soon as she comes into estrus or heat, um, and is ready to be bred, of course, that smell is going to bring in lots of male bears who certainly don't want those cubs, particularly the male cubs, yep. messing around <laughs> with that process and certainly want them to leave their mom alone. And so, uh, yes, typically with 399, the males who are courting her, and it's always the same male, um, most of 399's cubs uh, probably share the same father, although it's hard to prove that. There could yeah. be sometimes let me put it this way of the quadruplets there could be more than one father of the quadruplets so it's mm -hmm. not guaranteed but there's always this one male who likes to court her so that's always involved and he oftentimes is the one male who runs the cubs off that we see at least over the last 15 years uh but yeah so hard to say she will reinforce it sometimes the cubs come back and then she's like no no actually she's like you actually have to leave now yeah I'm sorry. you're on your own yeah um and uh when that happens hard to say do do bears keep their cubs for two years every time? No, there have been mother bears who kick their cubs off after a year. And there have been mother bears who keep their cubs uh, longer, mm -hmm. sometimes into the summer or fall, or there have even been cases where it's been longer, although that's very rare. Uh, 399 always kicks them off in May, usually. Uh, I've never seen an exception to that rule. Okay. Uh, so that would be my ex expectation, but. Who knows? The fun thing about 399 <laughs> is I've said again and again on this program is she does not do normal bear things all the time and gives us a run for our money. So if she surprises me, I just won't be surprised. Right? I'll and still you know, be surprised. We'll but. say like these facts and stuff, but there's always like general, like little exceptions to these rules. So an, yeah. an example would be that occasionally maybe a bear cub would stay with its mother for three years instead of two years because in biology, there's always exceptions. Yeah. Oh, this is a great one. I think this might have to be our last question. Um, go ahead, Tyler. Yeah, so 
In a recent, on a recent trip to the Rockies in Colorado, I saw two cow elk rear up on their hind legs and start fighting each other with their front hooves. What, what, or why do, or what do cows fight over? Really, really good question. Yeah, so we often see um, elk on the National Elk Refuge. We see those females actually rear up on their hind legs and do something called boxing. So that's where they, they kick at each other with the front hoods and their, their ears go back and they glare at each other in the eye. And there's a cup. There's two main reasons that I can think of of why elk would do this. And the first one would be food, and it's more common during the winter months. And so, uh, elk will often fight over food. And the females, you know, one female might have a good patch of grass that she just recently dug up, and another female might decide that she wants that grass, and so will approach that other female and challenge her for that forage. And what they'll do is they'll rear up on their hind legs and box. And I think there's a little bit of a dominance hierarchy at play. So I think the female, the the more dominant female elk tend to do the most boxing, tend to push the other female elk out of the way. And there tends to be a little bit of a genetic component as well. Elk typically won't push away their offspring. But if there's an unrelated elk that is feeding in an area and the dominant elk sees that, it's going to try and push that cow, cow elk away. Um, one thing that we've seen is that uh, cow elk tend to have less injuries from that fighting, um, or actually have more injuries from that fighting than bull elk. Mm-hmm. Bull elk actually have less injuries, and that's because their antlers are designed to prevent injury when they're actually sparring with each other, which is a little counterintuitive. So really cool question. Thank you so much. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Well, uh, you know what? This is a tough one, and I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to like put one minute into it, and it re- deserves 30 minutes. Cheryl asks, why do game and fish or fishing game kill grizzlies mm-hmm. instead of relocating them? This is really complicated. Yes. Uh, and I am not the end-all be-all answer to this. But the short answer is they do relocate them. Mm-hmm. Um, most grizzlies historically have had what they call a three strikes you're out rule because they are protected under the Endangered Species Act. Sometimes black bears don't have the same chances. We have over two million black bears in the United States. Their population mm-hmm. is not at threat of extinction. Um, And remember, aggressive black bears and grizzlies can be harmful to the public. And so Game and Fish has to manage in any state, but particularly Idaho, Montana, Wyoming, and Alaska, where grizzly bears Mm -hmm. live, they have to balance having viable wildlife populations and thriving grizzly populations with keeping the public safe. When grizzlies repeatedly get into food resources again and again and again, historically, they become aggressive towards people for those food resources. That's why the term a fed bear is a dead bear exists. Exactly. So they will make multiple attempts to relocate a bear unless that bear by the time they get to it is just so gratuitous they think there is a direct threat to public safety Mm -hmm. then they will go to the federal government and ask for a special exception to go ahead and remove that bear because of that concern nobody studied wildlife biology and went into game and fish so they could go kill bears that's not what they want to be Mm -hmm. doing it's incredibly regrettable Uh, And while we've had quite a few cases this year of grizzly bears um, being euthanized by game and fish, it's incredibly regrettable. Uh, Not something anybody wants. We can all make a difference Mm -hmm. by encouraging our neighbors to secure their garbage, chicken coops, aviaries, all of those things. There's a um, petition going around right now to try to get Teton County to create a bear-proof trash can mandate Mm -hmm. for all of Teton County instead of just the certain areas near the park currently that have it. Um, You can do your part by making sure that you keep um, bird feeders out of grizzly bear reach, dog food, all of those attractants. That's going to make the Mm -hmm. biggest difference. At the end of the day, Game and Fish just has to clean up the mess that uh, the public creates when they allow grizzly bears to get into stuff. And you know, that applies for all wildlife. So no matter where you live in the United States, if you're in Pennsylvania and you have white-tailed deer and raccoons coming into your your area, or if you're in Colorado where I'm from and you have black bears breaking into your trash cans, you can do your part in in, uh, minimizing your impact on wildlife and their behavior by securing your trash, your bird seed, and those food attractants. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to be in the situation we are when bears are... Uh, removed like that. But we also wouldn't want to hear about somebody dying 
because yeah. they became aggressive over a food resource. Exactly. And the human was stuck in the middle of that. So terrible thing to end on. I know. That's such a downer. <laughs> but you guys, it has been such a pleasure spending uh, this Wednesday with you all. We look forward to this every month, but yes, this has been exciting. particularly great. I do want to remind everybody we are off for November. Um, mm -hmm. We all have fun adventures to go on during our off season, so we won't be seeing you all. But we will be back in December with our best of 2021 episode. First Wednesday each month at 5.30. We certainly have enjoyed spending this time with you guys. These are great questions. These are really good questions yes. this week, guys. Thank you so much. All right. Everybody have a fantastic month. Stay wild out there. And our best wishes. Thank you, guys. <laughs>